So, sehr verehrte Damen und Herren, der Blick ging zur Uhr, es ist 10.41 Uhr, fast just in time. Everybody is here? Suchen Sie sich noch einen Platz, wir haben genug zu bieten. Vielleicht liegt es auch daran, dass äh, heute Morgen der Transport hier, hier zum Messegelände nicht ganz so optimal war. Die S-Bahn waren überfüllt, die Taxen schienen eine Schlange nach der anderen zu bilden. Seien Sie uns herzlich willkommen, einen schönen guten Morgen. Very welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Mein Name ist Blanca Weber, ich arbeite hier in der Nähe von Berlin als Journalistin, also für, für Reisethemen, für soziale Themen, für Politik. Wir sprechen Deutsch-Englisch heute, das nächste Panel wird auf Englisch stattfinden. Sie sehen schon unsere Themen heute im Laufe des Tages. Jetzt natürlich die große Frage Transport. Wer von A nach B möchte, kann das mehr oder weniger beschwerlich tun, ganz egal, ob es den Urlaub betrifft oder Businessreisende. Es geht um multimodale Beförderungssysteme und ich darf Ihnen gleich mehrere Fachleute dazu vorstellen und zu dem entsprechenden Panel überleiten. 12 Uhr steht hier auf der Bühne das große Programm Digitale Transformation für Sie bereit. Wir wollen uns widmen mit namhaften einigen Referenten, unter anderem von der Firma Google. Wie kriegen wir das hin, die Reisebranche 4.0 fit zu machen? Was bedeutet das? Worauf müssen wir uns einstellen? Sowohl als Reisende, aber auch als Anbieter, als Vermittler für Angebote. Was kommt auf uns zu? 13 Uhr wollen wir uns dem Partnerland der diesjährigen ITB den Malediven widmen und der großen Frage nachgehen, ökologische Nachhaltigkeit und ökonomischer Nutzen. Es geht nicht nur um den Fußabdruck, den berühmten, sondern auch die große Frage, was passiert dort und was passiert mit dem Land mit Blick auf den Tourismus in 30, 40, 50 Jahren. Sie alle wissen, das Land hat nicht sehr viel Meter über dem Meeresspiegel zu bieten. Und wir wollen gern wissen, was bedeutet der große Klimawandel für die Malediven, aber auch für den Tourismus in den nächsten Jahren. 14 Uhr switchen wir zum Kontinent Afrika und wollen uns anschauen, ob es gute Beispiele gibt, wir haben uns unter anderem Botswana ausgesucht, Community Based Tourism und wir schauen, wie sieht es aus mit Best Practice Beispielen, was können wir davon lernen, wer kann was eventuell auch übernehmen, dazu mehr 14 Uhr, 15 Uhr schauen wir nach Lateinamerika und 16.15 Uhr widmen wir uns dem großen Thema Flüchtlinge. Gestern wurde hier in diesem Raum unter anderem gesagt, das 21. Jahrhundert ist das Jahrhundert der Flüchtlinge, nicht nur jene, die aus Kriegs- und Krisengebieten kommen, sondern auch Klimaflüchtlinge. Also was kommt auf uns zu diesem sehr wichtigen Thema? Wir haben es gestern gehört, wie tiefgreifend das in alle Bereiche eindringt, diesem wichtigen Thema widmen wir uns heute im letzten Panel, in der letzten Session 16.15 Uhr. Schön, dass Sie alle da sind. Ich darf jetzt überleiten und I'd like to introduce Philip Wolf, founder from the famous company Focus Right. Your topics, Philip, are travel, tourism, hospitality, intelligence, to bring new ideas together with business. And now You're a very famous person, outspoken, also a provocative person, well known for the travel industry. He was involved in the sale of new trade to Expedia, but also for other companies. He was the CEO of the Winter founded software developer and travel booking engine pioneer. There will be much more to say about you, but I like to say very welcome. We are proud to have you here. The stage is yours, please. Good morning, everybody. This session holds a special place in my heart. I founded Focusrite in 1994, pre-web, before the web. How many of you were online travel zealots in 1994? Right? I used to give speeches, and people literally hated my guts. I've actually had tomatoes thrown at me. Lectured about Philip. I don't understand anything about travel and tourism and those mean cold cruel calculating Computers will never play a role in the world's third largest industry travels about 10% of global GDP The reason today is so special is first it was domestic airline tickets in the United States That was it. I remember in 1998. I introduced the possibility of a hotel booked online 
People said, no, it's air only. And if you map the grid of the expansion of technology and innovation in the world's third largest industry, you will see it has spread geographically all over the world and what I call by sector. Right? A couple of years ago, finally, tours and activities, the things people do when they get to the destination, started to get hot. TripAdvisor bought Viator, there's Go Euro here. And one of the last frontiers in travel as technology innovation relates to it is what we call uh, ground transportation. And now there probably isn't one geographical location left on planet Earth, maybe one or two in North Korea, and not one sector or subsector left uh, where uh, technology and innovation haven't disrupted the way customers search, shop, and buy what they do. So it's with great pleasure I introduce our panelists. Our first speaker is a former investment banker. He managed growth for that company that turned carpool. He manages growth for the company that has turned carpooling into a company that's now valued, valued at $1.6 billion US, 25 million members, over 22 countries. And we're going to hear what's next. Please welcome Philippe Carrell, growth manager with Blah Blah Car. Welcome. The Uber of laundry, the Uber of helicopters, the Uber of wine, the Uber of snow plowing. Many imitate, but our next speaker's company, a unicorn, if you know what that is, many, many, many times over, was among the first to innovate, in inspiring today's burgeoning on demand and peer to peer economy. Please welcome Uber's Ge general manager for Germany, Christian Fries. Welcome, Christian. A Harvard MBA, the company he founded, took on the formidable task of bringing MetaSearch to the global segment, aggregating hundreds of bus companies and transactions in over 6,000 cities now. Please welcome the co-founder and CEO of BusBud, L.P. Maurice. Welcome, L.P. From car rental to limousines to taxis, trains, and shuttles, his company brings ground transportation into the entire global travel ecosystem. Please welcome the CEO of Car Trawler, Mr. Mike McGuerty. Welcome, Mike. A veteran of ITA software that's owned by Google now, our next speaker co-founded a company set on powering the renaissance of rail with a unified platform that brings together 35 real companies and 1,500 transit operators. Please welcome the co-founder and president of Silver Rail Technologies, Will Philipson. <laughs> welcome. And finally, a PhD in telecommunications. He co-founded a company that counters the on-demand revolution with prearranged car service from licensed insured drivers. Consistent quality across more than 180 cities worldwide. Please welcome the co-founder and CEO of Blackline, Jens Waltorf. Great. So I told you, it was a distinguished uh, crowd. So I want to get this geography thing. So you're from France, and you're headquartered in France. Yep. You're from Germany, headquartered in the United States. You're from Montreal, Canada, headquartered in Montreal. You're Irish, of course, <laughs> in Ireland. You're from Montreal, and now you're in London and German. OK, so that's a good, uh, good, good crowd. So what, why don't we uh, just quickly share with the audience what year your company was founded and how many employees do you have now? So. Black Lane was um, founded a good three years ago, um, yeah. 2012. And, uh, here in Berlin? Here in Berlin, yeah. yeah. That's where our headquarters is based. You had a long commute today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. very comfortable. And we um, do employ roughly 200 people by 200. now. 200. Three years old, 200 in Berlin? 2009, about 210 employees mm. spread all over the world. Is that because you need to be near the train operators at the end of the day? I wish. Um, it's where the talent is, uh, okay. mostly through There's acquisitions talent. and things like that. 
I think you're the veteran on the stage. Yeah, so 11 so. years ago. 2004, uh, we're headquartered in Dublin. Uh, we've almost 500 people. Wow. So we started in 2011. We're about 40 people, all based in Montreal, Canada. Yeah. <clears throat> Uber is um, a little bit older I've than five years. I've heard of that, I've heard of that company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, a little bit older than five years, and I think we are between six and seven thousand employees. And how long have you worked for Uber? Uh, one and a half years. One and a half. Did you have any <coughs> idea it would even get as big as it is today one and a half years ago? No, I was actually always surprised that there are always these statistics getting updated that actually now uh, 60, 70 percent uh, of the company is with Uber less than a year. So there has been a tremendous growth over the last year. I can only imagine what that human resource department is like. <laughs> Philippe. Um, Black Black Hour was founded in 2006, and now we're 450 people. And one of the great venture-funded success stories out of France. There's not a lot of them, so congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. And we're happy to prove that you know, French businesses can go international. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Priceline Group just bought uh, Price Match. That's another French travel tech company. It's part of a uh, booking suite. So that the uh, audience understands. So at Black Lane, it's, uh, you can schedule in advance professional insured rides. I'll go back and forth. Blah Blah Car is, uh, do you like it or not like it when someone says legalized hitchhiking? You like that description or not really? We're not legalized hitchhiking. Okay. <laughs> Can you give me, give me another chance? It's an opportunity for drivers and passengers to connect in advance and share a ride from points to points all over the world. Yeah, we're effectively connecting people. Yeah. Um, so drivers on the one side, people like you and me, so not professional drivers, with passengers going in the same direction. Yeah. And the key element is A, the connection, and B, creating the trust between these people who don't know each other. Yeah. I've seen that heat map of, has anyone else seen it, a blah blah car of all the cars driving people at any mo moment in time, it's uh, very interesting. Silver Rail is just integrating lots of train reservations, yeah. which is a big challenge because... Because trains are historically national infrastructure. Uh, maintained to move troops in the time of war and yeah. uh, in peacetime to let people go visit grandma. And so things stop at uh, national borders and it's very different from one But you're actually to integrating disparate reservation systems across international borders, creating a unified uh, platform. Trying to deliver a customer experience that makes it easy and accessible, which I think is yeah. sort of the common trait amongst all of us here. Everybody else has a description of Uber, but it's good to hear from the inside. Um, I mean, is there anybody that doesn't, like, do you meet anyone in the elevator that doesn't even know what Uber is today? <laughs> good point. Um, yeah, in, in one line, is, it's, um, we are a platform that's connecting riders with drivers. Um, the drivers could be um, in markets where P2P um, ride sharing is legalized, it could be um, uh, a private uh, driver that is uh, going on the way to his uh, work or coming back or just uh, a casual driver. And riders is basically our international community um, uh, offering uh, with one tap of a button a ride within minutes that is safe, that is cost efficient, and that is transparent. So yeah. this is our ambition here. Yeah. How many different sub Uber brands are there? Like, cause I've used, I've, I've used now Uber now in 30 different countries, so I'm kind of proud of that. I don't know if many people have done that, but Uber Black and Uber SUV and Uber X, people know over those, but then you got Pop and Pool, and when I visit my daughter in San Francisco, you've got things piloting. Never. How many total are there? Actually, I don't know the number, but <laughs> I, I completely agree. I, I think we're doing many things really fantastically, but uh, probably what we fail to do is really... Um, getting like the product naming right, so I think like there are probably 30, 40 products worldwide, wow. and it's, it has to be understood because the markets are all very, very local. So we are a company now that's present in over 60, no, I think actually 70 countries, 400 cities, and the, every market, every single 
city is a very different environment where the demand is looking very differently. We just launched um, a motorcycle product in Thailand. So it's very common to just jump on a, uh, behind somebody's uh, motorcycle seat. So obviously you need a different product there than you need in Berlin, yeah. where maybe it's, it's a much tougher regulated market where uh, people feel everything uh, needs to be properly licensed and checked and, and, yeah. and concessioned, etc. So um, uh, you have to understand that, that every single market needs its own different. dedicated product. Anybody else doing motorcycles or rickshaws or? Not yet, but it would be a nice addition yeah. to our service class. Blah blah card yeah. does? No, no, we don't do repairs. <laughs> I did. I was in uh, Saigon in November, Ho Chi Minh City, and I, we did. There was this guy that had uh, the old Russian motorcycles with a sidecar, and he actually took people on uh, on rides around. So. Car trawler, 11 years old, your roots are in car rental? Correct, yeah. And so how many years did you do pretty much just car rental? Uh, pretty much up until uh, 12 months ago. And so predominantly we're B2B business. Uh, we deal with about 90 plus airlines on a global basis at the moment. That means we've access to about 800 plus million customers, yeah. passengers. Um, and one of the things that uh, we saw was that not everybody wants to book a car, a car rental. So uh, for us, we had the relationship and we were embedded in the technology of our partners. So it was broadening out the product to make sure that we're meeting all of the customer yeah. needs and not just car rental. So the audience understands if you're on an airline website, you've booked a ticket and you see the opportunity to rent a car or hire a car, Nine times out of ten, it's a private label by a car troll. Got that right, didn't yep. you? Yep. yep. And what happened in the last year? Like, so you're an 11-year-old company, mm. nine, ten years, car rental's a nice business. You had a, a nice transaction in private equity. What happened in the marketplace recently that strategically, when you locked yourselves up in your own board meeting or management meeting, you decided you need to expand into multiple ground transport? Sure. Uh, well, I think there's a couple of things. I think there's been lots of innovation by lots of companies These that guys. are here today yeah. on the stage that have introduced uh, a better product uh, uh, for customers to use. Uh, and therefore, it was giving access to the customers that we uh, deal with on a day-to-day -day basis greater choice. And for us, it's all about choice. So I, definitely, I think it was uh, innovation uh, uh, driven by a lot of the companies here. Uh, I think the second thing is because of that innovation, uh, more and more people are now pre-booking uh, other forms of ground transportation. Cer certainly customers are, are trained. LP before I forget. And BusBud just focused on intercity bus transport, correct? Correct. Yeah. Yes. How big is that market? It's huge. Um, so we're an OTA focused on, on bus travel specifically, long haul. Um, there's thousands of carriers worldwide. Uh, in terms of transactions, we're looking at, at the minimum, a billion tickets sold per year. Uh, and it might be uh, multiples of that, depending on uh, just where you look, if you include Asia and China uh, as well, which is harder to measure. So it's a, it's a big market, and it's historically been underserved uh, by, by travel tech. Hmm. Share the story. like. Where did, where did you or where did your company like get the idea to launch? Because one thing I promised the team at ITB is to help the audience understand how to transfer an idea and actually execute it in a business and, and what's involved. Because I'm sure there's a few more ideas. In, by the way, there's a, a 10,000, I found out last night, 10,067 exhibitors at ITB this year, wow. and uh, the audience is like over, is it 187,000 or 200 and some thousand? So I'm assuming there's a few ideas roaming around the hallways, but what can you share, like where'd the idea come from, but more importantly, how did you move that idea into a business? Anybody? Let me, let me try to answer this for Black Lane. <clears throat> the idea is um, actually was, was based on my own use case. Um, I was a pretty heavy international traveler in my previous life. Um, still am. Um, but, but for um, a different first, reason. Yeah, for different reasons. But the first and the last mile was always a big issue. Um, flights were fine, hotels were fine, um, but getting to and from the airport and to the, and from the hotel 
that was um, always a disaster. Very local, very um, varying, um, a lot of varying qualities, um, and not uh, not very reliable. And um, and that was roughly in a time where um, like the the first apps um, uh, and smartphone penetration was hitting the market. Um, so we all of a sudden saw a potential to like really steering infrastructure on their way on the streets. Um, and my co-founder, um, my co-founder partner Frank, um, is coming from more technolo technological background. And this group of us um, actually then decided that so this market first, is What was ready. the first thing you did? So you, so you got this idea, you got yeah. your team together, but what did you do? Well, we, we did tons of research um, because I just knew um, the industry from the back seat. I had no idea how the drivers are behaving, what's the structure of the driver companies. Um, also, um, um, we might all know that like, um, ground transportation is a pretty highly regulated field, um, very local, and we had no clue how this industry is working. Um, so we were just investing yeah. did, time. Did all your companies have to do a lot of that research in the beginning? Really, to really learn, because I find a lot of companies just wing it, and then they they learn too many things too late, something like that. And I guess yes, and it also it's research and it's testing, mm. testing what works and what doesn't work, and iterating fast. And I guess that is something you would see across all the companies present today. Um, and and to you know talk about this, how this experience relates to what happened at BlaBlaCar, it was founded by. Um, uh, Frédéric Mazella, who had this need of going back home, and the trains were full, and he was seeing a lot of empty cars on the road. He's like, I should be able to jump on these cars. I need to create a tool that will help me do that. Yeah. Um, but I think you have those three steps, right? You have the need, then you have the idea, and then you have creating a product that works at scale. And where this really becomes interesting is how you transform the idea into something that works yeah. at scale. Because the Germans were doing this before. Right, you had Mitfar Gedegenheit doing ride sharing in the 80s. Um, now, what happened is the the founders turned this um, idea into a product that worked at scale through mobile, through uh, right, cause apps. You're on some. A lot of companies start something and say, "Oh, we're first," but they don't know how to scale, or they don't think about scaling. And then somebody else comes along and takes it to the to the next level. I'm, I think like if you look at, that's why I find it such a fascinating group here that um, we have all different modes of, of ground transportation here. I think in the end, the market we actually tap all into is, is the car ownership market. So like we just discussed it um, behind the stage that obviously there's no automotive company here because actually we are all six are working on replacing uh, the need to own a car. So it could be like uh, on long distance, you take a bus, you take a rail, you take um, blah, blah, car, um, just and in, in, in join a much more efficient uh, way of transportation. But then on the last mile, you don't know really how to get from the bus station back home. You pre-book a, a limousine or you, you use Uber to get um, a safe and reliable mm -hmm. ride back home. So I think like the big, big piece here, and that's the, the big pot or where the money also is, is, is car ownership. Because if you think of it, a car is only used one hour per day. We all hear that statistic quite often. So it's actually not something that we use very efficiently. And we all work on, on making the system much more efficiently, yeah. breaking up the silo that we saw like for many, many decades between the different modes here. And now we sit on, on yeah. one and panel many, here and, and share how many the same cars? vision. Uh, I know Pierre told me last year, how many cars on planet Earth? Oh, I've heard the numbers, of almost two billion, is it? To one point? Probably even more, I guess. Yeah, and uh, the, the average use case is it's idle 23 out of 24 hours uh, yeah. per day. I want to pick up on uh, uh, testing. Hold your thought, Will. So I noticed that you test, you test, you test. Yesterday I interviewed Darren Houston, the CEO of the Priceline Group, just at Booking.com. They have uh, 10, 11,000 employees, 45 product teams, and nothing gets done without a test. I remember once told me that you cannot change a semicolon on an app or a website without a test. So, uh, and w one thing I've noticed, like more traditional companies 
will sit and discuss something they should do internally. We'll discuss it and discuss. And I, I have noticed successful companies, there's no discussion. Okay, we'll test it. I'll let you know next week. So how does testing play into your culture? Well, I think one of the things for testing, you need scale. So you need to have the volume. Uh, otherwise, it can take... Volume of users. Volume of users. Um, um, so we, we will test things. And some things, though, uh, I would, you know, are just, it depends what it is. It can be something so obvious that you just need to change it and get on with it. And I think, uh, you know, you're still, we're 11 years uh, old now, but the business moves at a quicker pace today than it did 10 years ago. Mm. Uh, so you have to get on with things. And lots of things, yes, you can A-B test. You need the volume, and then you need to make the decision and, and get on with it. Who wants to tell the audience what A-B testing is? Any volunteers? Don't make me do it. I know at least than anybody. But. Well, just uh, the le leveraging your platform and in, um, in, in running two different things in parallel. Um, yeah. So there's typically a, a lot, for instance, around price A-B testing, where you, um, depending on what customer is visit visiting your platform, you play a price X out to the first customer and apply uh, another yeah. price to the other, and then you compare the behaviors. In, in one market, like in the United States, how many different versions of Uber are there simultaneously? So I, I think like A-B testing is super critical for, for these fast-moving companies because you cannot just sit within and try to figure out what's going on. You really need to expose it to the, to the users and develop it with them together. And yeah. I think that's that's approach we really embrace um, to the max. They're probably like a couple of thousand AP tests running at the same time on different levels. Thousand. And, yeah, thousands. Oh, thousands. I know there's a, a thousand, like everybody goes to Google, for example, and thinks you're all looking at the same thing. But I know there's over a thousand <laughs> simultaneous different versions of uh, Google. So hopefully the audience gets that. The better way to try new things is talk, discuss it less in your office, and put it out to your customers, and put half one of your ideas out half the time and the other one simultaneously, and see which dogs like which, which dog food. For, for this whole innovative section of the marketplace, it's normal. They, these guys are going to fall asleep if we f talk about A-B testing anymore, but it's still uh, very, very important. Will, you were, I cut you off there. No, no, no. Uh, I, I was going to mention that I think one of the interesting things is this transition of moving from cars to what we do is all about information because the auto industry did a fabulous job for eons of saying how convenient a vehicle was. You know, you can go anywhere, you can do anything. And I think a couple of the guys mentioned the part that we're trying to solve is in the past when you went somewhere on a business trip or whatnot, that last mile of getting anything other than the major established methods of transport yeah. were very, very difficult. Yeah. You didn't speak the language, you didn't know where the taxi stand was, it was impossible. And I think that's what we're all doing is that liberalization of information yeah. and presenting it to the consumer to give them an experience and a confidence to, yeah, to, I saw, to do something. I saw a video of a testimony, I think it was a suburb of Los Angeles, because Uber's always getting attacked by taxi and municipalities, and a woman uh, testified she was in a taxi and uh, something bad happened uh, between her and the driver, and she's saying, and I ha nobody knows who I am and nobody knows where I am. And she said, when I'm in an Uber car, everybody knows who I am, everybody knows who the driver is, everybody knows who the car is, and everybody knows where I am. And then the, the video went up to all the bureaucrats sitting around the table, and you could see they went. So how does that issue, like, when you disrupt, the established players don't like you because you're stealing market share, you're altering the economics, but then you talk about safety and uh, less pollution and uh, less congestion with traffic and easing parking and every bureaucrat wants let more safety, less traffic, better parking. So how do you balance people hating you when you disrupt even though if they would shut up and listen you have a lot of common, common arguments you're making? 
I suppose you can look at it that, uh, yes, we're all disruptive up here uh, in some form, but uh, for me, a lot of it comes down to the customer choice. Uh, so the customer will choose different products, and we see through our platform now, depending on the time of day, their preferences will change. So if I'm arriving into an airport at 11 p.m. at night, it's uh, more likely that I'll want to have pre-booked uh, a taxi ride from the airport to my hotel or wherever my final destination is. Uh, if I'm going in as well, but I need a car rental, the brands that I choose or the, the, the uh, supplier or the customer score that it has will change the behavior. So for us, yes, we're disruptive, uh, but I think the key uh, um, thing that's driving that is that customers want choice now. They want to choose the, uh, the most uh, the best fit yeah. for their needs at any particular time, and, and those needs change throughout the day depending on what time of day it is, etc. Yeah. I guess the issue is that um, the, the world is disrupt disruptive is, is fashionable, and you know, tech companies like to use it, but it has like all these negative connotations. If you're disrupting something, you're kind of breaking it, you're breaking something, right? Yeah. We're not breaking anything, uh, we're just trying to propose a new solution. And we're trying to help people go from A to B um, with a different manner and I save would, a cost. I would jump in on that and say, I don't think within a certain realm here, nothing here is new. You know, people have been, I apologize, but hitchhiking or sharing cars for a long time. People have been hailing cabs or other modes of transport or booking cars. What's different here is the scale. Yeah. You know, if you have a bad experience at a taxi cab outside, who do you yell at? Who do you get upset at? Who do you report it? Uh, yeah. There are incidences of people getting attacked. Accountability like is that. a big part of it. Yeah. yeah, and now all of a sudden you have this global brand of Uber that it's very easy to point at Uber. There's less inst instances, is my supposition, of any bad things happening because of what you said in terms of that transparency. Uh, but it's difficult to... to um, blame a small ca car company where, or an individual, whereas you've got this big icon there. I think it's uh, also a lot about um, education, what, what you, Christian, just said earlier. Um, we all experience that the, the car ownership is going away, and all those budgets are, flying in the, uh, are flowing into the mobility space. Yeah. So this, this market is hugely growing, even for a taxi, right? Like, because people use, use uh, modes like, like ours more and more often. Um, so this is what you have to explain over and over again. Yeah. You, you can be disruptive and, and grow the pie at the same time. Right. I think we're a good example of that because essentially by making it easier for people to take the bus, uh, they'll just take it more often. And you know, we're essentially disrupting the station, the, the, the bus sta physical bus station, more than the companies anyways. So we ended up selling more seats for the bus companies, bringing new clientele, and increasing their revenues. Uh, so I think you can be disruptive and, 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 and also create value for, for your partners yeah. and, and basically uh, grow, grow the pie. I think but, also, hold on. By the way, to the audience, we got a lot of uh, smart people and we'll have no problem talking, but if you do have a question or a comment, just please wave your hand, interrupt, and uh, we'll be glad to uh, entertain your question. Christian, I think sorry. also we have to explain much better what technology actually can do nowadays because I think... Like, uh, this audience is probably a, a, a good example. So, like, most of you at the end of the day will go either to the train station or go to the airport. So, in this audience, we could just split up everybody to the airport on the left, everybody uh, to the train station on the right, and now we share cars to the two destinations. So, we could all share a car, like, sit three, four people in one car. But nowadays, actually, technology can enable that, like, just randomly. Like, Strangers can just, that are going the same way, can share a car. At Uber, we call that Uber pool. So basically, you type in your destination, you press a button, a car is coming, and on the way to your destination, it's picking somebody up, taking maybe a small detour, but in the end, you share the ride. And it's beneficial for everybody. The driver is really happy because he's making twice the money. The rider is happy because he's paying less. So in the end, everybody is, is, is benefiting from it, but that's only possible because of technology, and I think that right. story how, we have to tell. How many countries are, is Uberpool in now? Um, Uberpool is active now in something like 20 countries. Oh. So if, if you guys ask me, so okay, you're a disruptive company, so, but what's, what's the next on, on your agenda? It's Uberpool. So the vision is really 
to have Uber pool in, in all cities just because we will believe that that's actually the way to take cars off the road because you just put two guys into one car. In the end, the traffic is less, you need less cars on the road, etc. So that's, that's where we are heading. You need a certain size for that. Um, so that's not why we can just start yeah. it out of a blue everywhere, but in, in a lot of countries it's already and live. Is Uber Pool more competitive with Blah Blah Car or not because it's real time versus scheduled? Or is that the most competitive thing Uber's done vis a vis Blah Blah Car? So I guess the two big differences here is Uber Pool would be intracity. Um, Interesting. Within okay. Berlin or within Paris, within London. Um, Bablacar is very much intercity Inter product, so it's something that's going to take you from Berlin to Hamburg, Berlin to Munich, or Munich to Dresden, for instance. Yeah. And, and talking about um, LP's comment on, on growing the pie, I think you know by bringing this new solution at scale, what we we also bring the cost down, so we we afford for more people to be able to travel, and essentially, you know, more people are traveling. So. Yeah. It's not a zero-sum game. And, and what's the uh, the BMW service where you uh, rent the car? Uh, drive now. Drive now. It was interesting. So for those of you not from, they could have been on stage here. The drive now is uh, with your app, you can find a car parked anywhere and rent it by the minute. And there's two different rates: one for driving it, and if you go grocery shopping while it's parked, it's I think 60% less and you can park it anywhere there's a legal uh, parking space. But the interesting thing to you, Warren, is I was with somebody uh, from BMW and they said, well, doesn't that you know, scare you because that people won't be buying? And they actually said, I'd love to get rid of car dealerships and, and distribution and manufacture a car, get it right onto the street, and it starts generating uh, revenue. So it's really amazing how all of this is changing, uh, changing the, the thinking. So it's interesting, you're intercity also, you're intercity, you're mostly intra-city, you're mostly intra-city. Oh, longer, longer distances actually right. too. Yeah. But it's more difficult, right? The challenges yeah. or the prices. Well, when you cross borders, then it gets a yeah. bit messy. Yeah. And you're everywhere, so. Yeah. I have a question, in the early 1900s, I, there were hundreds of automobile manufacturers in the world. It's like a common thing. And today, I've, there's only a couple of countries that still manufacture cars and only a couple of companies. So uh, when I got involved in online travel in the early 90s, there was, there was over 100 OTAs, online travel agencies. I knew all of them. And now Priceline Group and Ex Expedia dominate in the in OTA land. There's very, very few big independent OTAs left, you know, a couple in Europe, one Fairport in the United States. But it seems like when a new category like ground starts, there's all these microscopic differences. Between, I, I could have had 25 people on the stage, and each one of them would have explained some technical difference. Uh, between our businesses, but where, where do you see this going? I mean, is consolidation inevitable, and how is that going to work? So maybe one day Blacklane is buying Uber, let's see. Yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, definitely, like, we are, the, the people that are sitting here, you can already sense how complementary those services are. Um, so there are definitely use cases, at least for a pretty tight commercial partnership, and um, potentially then also some... Well, commercial some partnerships first, but... But even Expedia bought home away, right? So, I mean, it's, it, it seems like, you know. And then another whole layer that's not on the stage is what the industry is calling multimodal. I don't know if that label will last, but companies like Mozio and Rome to Rio uh, are aggregating how to get from A to B and mix air, car, walking, bus, train, and, and ferry. But it's confusing. I, I think scale is very important yeah. for, for, for me, and I think all the companies up here uh, have huge scale already. So I think people who don't have scale today, I think 
you know, it is going to be difficult for them going yeah. forward uh, because you need scale for everything, for learning, like, you know, through data science, etc. All of that is very, very important and access to the customer. So I think scale will force some of the companies down there that there may be consolidation. In 2016, because we talked a lot about enabling technologies, obviously a lot of your businesses just wouldn't work five years ago. Yeah. Uh, but help, help the audience understand. We use the word scale all the time, like testing. But how would, you, how would you explain what you mean by scaling in this context to the, to the audience? What does that mean? So for example, in, in Europe at the moment, uh, we would have, with all of the airline relationships we have, uh, we would see about 40% of the passenger movements, online passenger movements, any given day through the airline relationships we have. So that gives us a huge understanding of what customers are looking for, what they want, et cetera. So that scale allows us to get the best products and fit them with the customer needs. It also allows us to understand, well, what combination of products do we display? Because not everybody wants to book a car rental, so it's based on the destination, it's based so on... scale has something to do with how many customers and how many prospects you have at any moment in time? Actually, from from our perspective, it's more relevant in the supplier space. Yeah. Um, so we are actually, we, could, we are integrated in a car trawler, yeah. so we are one level deeper directly sitting on the infrastructure. Um, and for us, it's mandatory to have scale in a market, otherwise you cannot steer the infrastructure, you cannot utilize them. So what, do you see scale more of a supply side phenomenon or a buy side phenomenon? Um, for me, actually, scale is more about efficiency because in the end, uh, what we bring to the table is a system that is currently heavily underutilized. If you look at a taxi, on average, it is 72% off trip. So in those 28%, you basically, the, the, the taxi driver has to generate the entire money he needs to make in that hour. Our efficiency is going more to 80%. So that's why we can lower the prices, take a commission for ourselves, and still give uh, 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 a higher income to the to the drivers and how we do that is by scale because the bigger you are the closer demand is is next to each other so literally in our mature markets in London if you book an Uber with a tap of a button the car is already there you can probably see it it just dropped off somebody and it's just rolling the last 10 meters uh, in front of you and that obviously increases the downtime yeah. and that's how we can uh, offer the efficient um, solution here. So scale for us is more really um, bringing the downtimes down, utilize the system that is there and just waiting to be used yeah. uh, much more. We also see this in the hotel chain side. You, you all know that Marriott is merging with Starwood or acquired. Within weeks of that announcement, Accor announced the acquisition of Fairmont and Raffles and there's been a lot more. But I had a dinner last month with a senior exec from Accor, and I said, well, everybody's speculating, but why are the big hotel chains acquiring and merging? And he, said, he just looked me straight in the face and loud said, size matters now more than ever. So it's a, it's a, it, 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 it's a big thing. I think economies of scale, right, yeah. is, is uh, for us, we see ourselves as a digital infrastructure uh, for the rail yeah. industry. And, uh, the railways in particular are in an incredibly competitive environment. They may not fully understand yeah. that they are yet with the, these guys' clients. And to drive down that cost of scale to let them attack yeah. their market and get their customers requires so, efficiency. So something has to give here because uh, short of Uber, your company, well, uh, how many employees does Blah Blah Car have now? 450. So short of Uber, your companies aren't very big and you're talking about how size matters and economy, so something's gonna have, something's gonna give here, right? Our goal is not to scale in, in employees, yeah. if we can. So that, we that's want, why scale who, is, who doesn't have that goal? Scale is two-sided, right? You've got yeah. scale as an organization, yeah. where you're trying to reach the most standardized, far-reaching product with as few people as you can. Um, but scale is also on the customer yeah. side, trying to have millions of customers or members for Blah Blah Car that create this matching. So that means drivers will find passengers because there are millions of them going to the site every day. I think I, think I just read Pinterest hit, is this right, a billion users? Or was it Instagram? I can't, one of them just hit a billion users. 
and they have four, for under 400 employees. But I think that's, that, awesome. that, that's, that's really yeah. important, especially on a, on a day like this, on, on the ITB, where we have, hear from so many countries that you don't want to have like 15 apps for the 15 countries to, to pre-book a limousine. Yeah. You don't want to go to South America and try to understand what is um, the carpooling option there. You just want to have one app, one solution, one service level, one payment method, wherever I go, and I feel much more um, safer and uh, in my own environment if I use one of these apps I use at home um, where I'm used to, and, and that's where I think like everybody of us is definitely benefiting from trying to build up a global brand that has the same service so level, the so same Christian, quality. Let's, t let's take that a step further. So I think a lot of people agree that most apps on a phone don't get used and consolidating. But then the debate is which player or which sector of the ecosystem has the positioning with the audience. Like, is it an OTA? Is it, an, you know, you would say the airline has the customer. An OTA said, we have all the airlines and all the hotels. So who, who, is, who is going to have the app or the apps that become the go-to for all these different things? How do you figure that out? I mean, that is the fascinating thing with uh, smartphones. And because you were talking about concentration before, and will this sector eventually be owned by one or two companies? Well, actually, if you look at a smartphone and what people do, they will select each app that is the most relevant for that very particular way of yeah. what they want to do. So the phone is it. But it, it yeah. also allows to have many different... Um, so as, as Christian was saying, you only want to have one per type of thing you want to do, but you're happy to have you know, very specific... Right, but the definition product. of type of thing you want to do is the moving... So target, taxi, right? so let's say intra-city versus intercity versus looking up option, I'm going to use a yeah. meta search, or I already know what's my option, I'm going to go straight to that provider. Yeah. Uh, what I, what I find fascinating is, the, is what Google and Facebook are trying to do, and, and some of the others, Twitter, I think, is even going down that path, but that whole idea of the conversation, moving it in from, not Facebook, but Facebook Messenger, and somebody saying, you know, what time's the train? and having automation behind the scenes pulling up, okay, here's your options, okay, book me a ticket, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I think that's going to be a very interesting evolution to see whether yeah. they can get that experience good enough because they don't have a lot of that human touch. They're all into the, the, the automatic uh, automation and things like that. I think that's like Sorry. five or ten years out, like multimodal search engines or chat. But like in the short term, like I had this exact same experience that Christian described when I was traveling in South America for three months. And I literally had to create upwards of 10 or 15 different accounts on different websites or download 10, 10 to 15 different apps uh, to take different bus companies. And I was just like, how crazy is that? First yeah. of all, I don't really trust these companies with my credit card, first of all. And then I, I really don't, I'm, not, I'm never going to come back to this website uh, for a while. So why do I need 15 different accounts? I want one account for bus. When I think about bus, and again, that definition might be smaller or bigger, like I just want one app. So I think in the short term, you'll have like one app per, per major category. And eventually, those apps will kind of combine or, or converge into kind of a more of a multimodal search engine. Maybe, yeah. maybe it's Google, maybe it's kind of yeah, mul may, multimodal. May, maybe we don't know what those categories, but I mean, that's why you compete, right? But there certainly are too many now. I think like, we, just because we spoke about the multimodal apps, I think that's a big trend right now, right? Trying to consolidate different modes. In my personal opinion, if we ask our users at, at Uber, they tell us that they're using many, many modes. So they're very, very multimodal um, in life. But still in the end, a dedicated app has always benefits over like, something consolidated. Just because I can see, for example, the license plate, I can see the photo, which can never be integrated into something that is aggregating it, which is giving the crucial additional touch on the safety I need. Yeah. Um, and, and it will be very hard for those um, multimodal apps, in my opinion, to monetize it in the end, because they would always go to that um, specific bus uh, app that has all the features that is necessary for that mode. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's maybe a, a personal uh, opinion, but... What, what is something that your companies uh, believe, based on research, based on your gut, etc., that you believe your customers really want right now? 
but you're having difficulty executing to deliver it to them? So we do see, when we look at our customer base, we um, separate into more the occasional traveler and the fre frequent traveler. And, uh, and we see exactly to, to, to Christian's point that the occasional traveler tends to use all kinds of different um, modes of transportation depending on the individual use case. While as, as more frequently you start traveling, you, st you start to build your, your first and second choices. So th those customers are directly then coming to Black Lane instead of booking um, on a car trawler widget on, a, on an airline site. Yeah. And so what is it you want to give your customers but and so we are quite like, executed. Yeah, while, we are, uh, while we are like building our brand, we are focusing on the frequent traveler and want to have a direct connect to them, also right. to enterprise customers. But for the occasional world, the leisure traveler world, we are happily cooperating with the OTAs, with airlines, with you're not, aggregators. You're not really good. Yeah. Anything else? What's something that you're dying to do in your company? You've got it whiteboarded, you've got it piloted, but for some reason you just can't get it out into the market. Anyone? I think there's a couple of things. Uh, one thing for me is choice. I think the customer does want choice, and I think that's why, the, yes, they may have dedicated apps that they repeatedly use for certain services, but uh, through, say, airlines as a distribution channel for us, they want choice on that platform if they want to boot through that platform. But is there something you're trying to do and you just haven't executed yet? Uh, I think just that level of integration because the customer will uh, purchase products at uh, many different times. So one of the things as a B2B, you have to have access to the customer at the right time. So getting that understanding of, uh, yeah. of when they're in the market rather than, you know, if I want an Uber, I go to the app. With a B2B relationship, you have to understand the customer at such a level that you're communicating yeah. to them at the right, most relevant time. I think the other thing that's really, really important is transparency. And that's one of the things that you have to um, uh, create, that trust. And we all talk about trust, but it is the most important thing. Yeah. Transparency to the customer and that they trust what they're booking. Anything else? You I guess um, on our side, what we see is people want more immediacy. Um, so to be very concrete, for a driver to be able to get in his car and say, hey, I'm going to Hamburg now, yeah. um, and I have two spare seats. And um, he'd like to be matched with somebody who's one kilometer down the road. Right now. And actually wants to go to Hamburg as well. Yeah. Um, but that will probably take more product development, maybe connected cars. It's not something yeah. that's doable today. I asked uh, Darren Houston yesterday, CEO of the Priceline Group, why did he pass on the home away? acquisition and he had two answers but the biggest answer was they don't have instant confirmation it's a big big issue it was okay for you know Expedia so you must have one thing you're dying to push out that just hasn't made it you got the big rebranding done <laughs> yeah I, I think um, I think like uh, in, in many many markets we're struggling to to convey what we bring to the table. So um, that vision of Uber Pool needs to be understood to see like where do we want to take traffic of tomorrow. Right. Um, and I think um, those types of, of, um, of solutions uh, is really something everybody will benefit from rider drivers, even, in t even cities. And I think in the end it's, it's very much um, uh, what, uh, what Blablacar is also trying to do to make it as easy as possible to share a ride and just uh, use the resources that are there. Yeah. I think like something around seamless travel door to door, you know, if you get to the airport and your, your black lane, you know, is waiting for you, you know, for us, you know, if it's getting the, the user from his home to the bus station to wherever he's going, whether it's a hotel or a ski mountain or wherever. Yeah. So it's combining basically all the services of the people on stage in a smart way for the user yeah. so that it meets their goals. My, my big example in airline travel, especially business class travel, the airlines have no problem asking you for a million things, what seat you want, how many bags you want, but for some damn reason they can't ask you what meal you want. Yeah. It's just amazing. In, to, in today's day and age, if you think about it, you know, they can get you boarding early, boarding late, they can get you in a middle seat, an aisle seat, they can take one bag, two bags. There's 28 parameters. There's only three choices, like chicken, pasta, and then she and gets like. down on her knees and <laughs> says, what would you like? And I'd say, I like the ravioli. And she said, I'm sorry, sir. 
only Same paper, thing. there's only fish left. And I mean, yeah. it's so out of, these things are so out of context that you know it's gonna, somebody's gonna disrupt. Uh, should uh, travel by train. There's, there's rail, railways that'll let you pre-select you know, your food. But then I have to lock my luggage to the, uh, the, the rail or something. <laughs> How many of you had a bag stolen on a train? Nobody. If you, Silver Rail could solve that, <laughs> really, I mean, that's... That's an add-on. It's a big thing. It's a, it's a, it's a big thing. No, but What's... Just, Philip, what you just said, like, this is one of our biggest challenges as we integrate into the travel chain. Um, like, dealing with those GDSs out there that are sitting on 30-year-old technology, this is really... Yeah, but customers cool. don't know what the word travel chain is. They don't know what the word GDS is. Yeah. Yeah, but like at the but ambition they do spend is, a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. We, with, the, with the vision behind is that yeah, like mobility totally gets out of your yeah. head, right? Like it's just there, and this is what we are aiming for. What's something you launched in the last year that you were really excited about, but had very disappointing results? Uh, do you think I'm going to get an answer? What do you think? I need your help. <laughs> Should I keep pushing for this? Yeah. I'm seeing a lot of nods, so somebody's got to bail me out here. We, or did, did I somehow only get perfection on, yeah, on the stage? Yeah, definitely not. Uh, no, we had like, it wasn't last year, but the year before we launched a special class in uh, service. The smart, class. what the was smart, that service? Yes. Smart class, like two seaters only and only two doors, which is basically, uh, funnily not allowed by German regulation, but we went over all that stuff. We were very proud when we had those on the street, and it was, it was just nice, those hordes oh. of smarts weaseling through the cities. Um, but we realized a little too late that actually our, our dispatching mechanism was not made for this world because all of a sudden we were not just filling trips of existing capacities, yeah. but we had a huge 24-7 gap, which was ours, yeah? Surely not everything Uber launches works. <laughs> the no, works that's, of first true, time. that's true. Like, um, I think it's also known um, that we are experimenting with other types of businesses just around side of uh, passenger transportation. For example, uh, we have a product that is called Uber Eats, where it has the same, it should bring the same value to the table as, as, as Uber in general. So you tap a button and a meal is coming within minutes. And we tried um, to uh, start that product where in the Uber app, you have two or three meals, very, very um, selected choice, but from the best uh, hand-picked restaurants, and you just press a button and really within two, three minutes, it's there. And we pivoted that, um, that business um, a couple of weeks ago just because we saw that customers actually want choice. So now it's more like another platform where restaurants are on there. We use the Uber drivers on the system to deliver it, so it's not coming within two, three minutes, but within 20, 25 minutes. And it's a much, much better product experience because I can choose from hundreds of meals and not only two, three. Okay, I have and to wait many, 20 markets, minutes longer, but it's much, how much more appealing. How many markets is Uber Eats? That type of Uber Eats is only in Toronto right now. Uh. Um, we have Uber Eats uh, tested in, in a couple of markets and saw exactly that behavior, that we need to change something and, and relaunch it. Yeah. Anybody else on stage experimenting or thinking about moving something other than a human being, like food, well, honestly? This is part of the normal limousine service industry that you like typically also transport like uh, uh, urgent documents. Or no, but is, there, is, but is, is, is that part of Black Lane's strategy of, now? No, not, not Anybody right else, idea. like blah, blah, car thinking about moving things? Or the yeah, we could, uh, I mean, we're, you know, thinking we, because we have this transport network that's already operating. Uh, that uh, people could actually carry goods, for instance. Um, like but maybe you, you don't want to travel as a person from Berlin to Hamburg, but you have a luggage or a guitar that you are, want are to you, get to Hamburg. Are, is it in a, a product mode now, or it's just no, really more of a discussion? It's just those ideas that when we do brainstorm and think, how, what else can we do with this yeah. awesome asset that we have? And that's the kind of thing that comes out. Yeah. So, something tells me this is going to spill over into non-human transport, because intellectually it just makes so much sense, right? You, you're investing all this money, technology, platform, yeah, so moving sure around, and uh, you know, just go ask an airline what percentage of their annual EBITDA is cargo and freight, the, the percentage is, 
because uh, they don't yell at you, they don't argue with you, <laughs> nothing. They don't want ravioli into, instead of fish. That gets yeah. into logistics, though, and then you're into the UPSs and FedExes yeah. of the world. A lot of you, uh, final question, a lot of you were uh, consultants or advisors in a, in, a, in a prior role, or you've certainly left with them. Just they're your customers out there. If you could give them a, a tip that really, uh, when they get home from ITB, they said that was worth something, what would you share with them? Don't all answer at once. Uh, look, uh, I think one of the big things is just because it's a great idea to you doesn't necessarily mean it's innovative and it's something that you can develop a business out of. Uh, so you need to be, in terms of how you due diligence your idea at the beginning and the people you talk to and how they influence that. Uh, yeah. And the first iteration of it may not be the right one and it takes a, a couple of very fast iterations to land on something that then can evolve into a business. It's a testing thing. Yeah, I guess we're all prejudiced to think that what we want as a person is what the other person or the average person wants. Yeah. That's not the case at all. So I think the two things here for businesses is A, ask your customer what they want, and B, iterate, test those assumptions, and see if it works. Yeah. Although I think asking via survey isn't as good as asking via testing, right? Would you? Yeah. yeah, it depends yeah. how complex your the first test is. is. Like yeah. We, we yeah. still in focus groups, what we learn in focus groups is it complements what you get back through surveys. Yeah. Uh, my, my number one advice would actually be to like, at some point after a bit of research, but to just do it, just give yeah. it a try, right? We had so many people telling us that it's never going to work, stop this, you have a much better career with your consultancy and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, even if I would have failed after one, two years or so, I wouldn't have, like, I would no have regrets. enjoyed every second of what, yeah. what I've done. Yeah. Well, that was fascinating. I, as I said in the beginning, I, n I never thought this day would come where my stage would be full of just ground transport innovative uh, companies. Ladies and gentlemen, Philippe Carroll, Christian Fries, LP Maurice, Mike McGeerty, Will Phillipson, and Jens Wolf, thank you all very much. Thanks,